Good morning, Facebook. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to bringing the zoo to you here at Brookfield Zoo. As always, we uh, thank you for your continued support. My name is Craig. I'm an animal care specialist here at Wild Encounters in our ambassador program. And I just wanted to wish you guys a happy early World Snake Day. So today we're going to be celebrating World Snake Day, which is on Friday, July 16th. With me, I have Jen with one of her favorites. This is Marceline. She's a ball python. And then over here, I have Marsha with Casper, her slithering sister. Sorry, <laughs> I was told to do that pun for you guys. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we're out here to, ready to celebrate World Snake Day a little bit early with you guys. World Snake Day is one of my favorite world holidays. Um, and the purpose of that is to just bring awareness to snakes, um, the things that they do for the environment and um, what we can just look how cute they are. I, I, I have no words. So, um, so like I said, World Snake Day is on July 16th. That's this Friday. So did you guys know that there are actually around 3,500 different species of snakes? There's, and, and that's just what's known. There could be some, some more and some less, but, um, or at least 3,500. And of those, only 600, around 600, are venomous. Uh, so that's only like an eighth of them. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, and then, of course... <laughs> only 600. Only 600, but, Lynette, of those <laughs> 600, only about 200 would actually pose um, a real risk to humans. And again, 200 is still a lot of, number, a lot of snakes that we would want to be wary of. But um, in the grand scheme of things, it's actually not that much. Okay. Um, so Could be a lot course, worse. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, you know, snakes uh, snakes do have a bad rap. Um, and that's understandable because they're um, such a unique animal that uh, gets a lot of bad attention in the media. Um, normally, uh, for the most part, snakes aren't really, um, most species aren't really endangered or anything like that. Um, but snakes do kind of... Uh, they undergo the same risks and threats that most other animals do, whether it's like predators or habitat loss or whatever. But in reality, the biggest uh, threat to snake conservation is uh, the, the reputation or, or the, the public perception of snakes. So today I just wanted to talk to you guys uh, specifically about these two, why they're so cool. And I mean, obviously, look at Casper's <laughs> little, little face. She's so adorable. Um, but yeah, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about why these guys are my favorite animal, one of my favorite animals. Of course, I like most, well, I like all animals, but the animals that I'm really drawn to are the ones that uh, do have that bad, bad reputation. And because uh, I like to talk about them and talk about, talk about why they're important, why we should care about them. And of course, I'm not asking all of you to run out and start petting snakes or go get one as a pet, but to just, you know, know, know a little bit more about them. Um, kind of be fascinated by what they do, but you know, in the grand scheme, just kind of watch them, observe them, but don't, you know, don't approach them or anything. And I know that it's a little bit cliche to say that uh, the animal is more scared of you than you are of it, but that is true with snakes. They really just want to be left alone. So as long as you don't approach them, they do give you warnings uh, that they're there and uh, asking you to go away before they would ever do anything else to you. So, like I said, this one that the camera's on now, this is Marceline. She's about eight or nine years old, and we don't know that for sure, because um, we did get her. Uh, she came out of a confiscation, both her and Casper. They were, um, they were being smuggled in, and they were caught at O'Hare, and where they came to us. Um, when we first got them, they were, they were really <laughs> small. They were malnourished. They were covered in mites. They were very nervous animals and with our excellent vet care they were um, treated and taken care of now they're nice happy and healthy and they've been part of our ambassador program and our our play zoo exhibit uh, since then and while uh, it did take a little bit of handling and, and um, working really closely with them these two animals are uh, some of our staff's favorite now and especially Casper who has quite a good following um, over Facebook and social media other social media but these animals will actually come out for programs and chats uh, in the play zoo with children and they seem to really enjoy just kind of being out with in the sun and with guests. I, yeah, look at her go. She's uh, really checking it out. So Casper's cool because um, as you notice right away, she looks very different from Marceline and not, not to say that Marceline's not cool, 
but um, Casper is clearly different. Uh, so she is this all white. She has no pattern, so they call that leucistic, uh, in which case she doesn't have like any pigment, any pattern, she's all white. Not to be confused with an albino snake, an albino snake will have a pattern still. You'll see a lot of like yellow and white and orange colorations and her eyes would be red. Casper does not have red eyes, so that's what makes her, it's almost even more unique, um, which is why uh, somebody would try to be smuggling the snake through. Mm -hmm. They could either try and breed her for other similar animals or at least just sell her and, and during that time the snake probably could have gone for a few thousand dollars. But Casper now, though, at the same time, would, is not a, a non-releasable animal. This animal would not survive in the wild, especially, I mean, they come from Africa, so automatically the environment's completely different. But this animal has no camouflage. So as you can see, we like to put her on this pegboard here. This kind of has a naturalistic look, so we can demonstrate the importance of camouflage uh, and talk about how, you know, obviously Casper has to make... Uh, remain under professional care because she wouldn't survive even if we put her back where she's supposed to be. Then, <clears throat> go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, can you remind us what type of snakes these are? Yes, so Casper and Marceline are both ball pythons. Pretty common in the pet trade and they actually do make really good pets as long as you you know you know how to take care of a snake and, and you're willing to commit yourself to that and uh, I mean they can have a lifespan of 20 to 30 years under professional care too so you you are getting into a bit a bit of a commitment with them so as long as you know how to properly care for them and you're willing to do that they make really good pets the ball python is a re relatively timid uh, species of snake they are very unlikely to strike out of fear they will ball up and protect and hide their head and protect their head before anything else is that um, why they're called the ball python? Yeah, exactly. Look at that. But they're also called the royal python, which is why Marceline here is named Marceline, because she's named after Marceline the Vampire Queen from Adventure Time. I know some people will get that reference, hopefully. Um, but yeah, so they're also called the royal python because they are, they'll, um, royalty would wear them as jewelry, like around the, the wrist or even around the neck, and they'll just kind of coil up and just sit there comfortably and just chill. But so you can see the difference again between Casper and Marceline. Marceline, while well, you know she, you can still see her really well against this background. This isn't what she would uh, be hiding in normally, but you can still see like how the diff the contrast with the background and Casper versus the background and Marceline over here. So they're both flicking their tongues out quite a bit. What are they doing? So they're exploring right now, but um, as they flip their tongue out, they're actually using their tongue to collect scent particles. So they're effectively smelling. And uh, while they do have nostrils, they don't really smell with their nostrils. That's for, for breathing. So they, they use their tongue to basically check everything out. They're, if they find prey, you know, they might increase the tongue flicking and kind of move off in that direction if they're looking for something. But um, many snakes tend to be ambush predators, so um, they'll tend to kind of hide and sit still and wait for something to come across them and then strike out and grab it. So for now, she's just, they're just getting some outside time, they're exploring. They're, we do put, we have put other snakes and even some other animals on these, so they're, they're mm -hmm. probably picking up on some of those scents too and they're just kind of checking everything out. It's good enrichment for them. It's very good enrichment. So how much do they eat? Well, it, it depends on the, the species of snake. It depends on the age. I'd say I, where we're at now with these two, I believe they eat every other week now. Um, so they they eat pretty infrequently because they're mostly full grown. So what we, we're doing here, uh, we feed them every other week. They get a, a large prey item to, you know, digest and get them through two weeks. Uh, but that's why we can... Um, increase the amount of handling time with them because we don't handle them right after they eat to give them you know proper time to digest. How big do they get and is there a difference between how big they get in their natural habitat versus professional or managed care? Definitely. So um, these snakes tend to be between three and four feet long and they're pretty hefty snakes. They're kind of like same length as like a corn snake maybe but they're much thicker and then um, the snake will typically grow as quickly as they uh, 
are fed or depending on the amount of food that they can eat so a successful snake in the wild will grow nicely if they're you know able to catch food regularly um she's so interested today but with these guys there is kind of a a proper rate of growth that each snake should have so we don't you know we don't overfeed them and make them grow quickly um but we do you know we we weigh them we track all those weights make sure that there's a nice steady growth line we also take measurements to make sure that they're growing in that direction as well but um but yes uh, de depending on how often they eat that'll kind of determine how fast they grow when they're young hmm. what types of things do they eat right now uh they i believe they both eat like a small or medium rat and maybe like an extra mouse every so often um, and again, that depends on how big they are too. So they say that a snake for the, the size of food that they can eat uh, is determined by like how the thickest part of their body here. So when they're little, we don't try and give them something that's like this big around because they might not be able to handle it. But um, as they're growing and as uh, their weight starts to maybe um, plateau a little bit, we'll start to think about whether we want to increase the number of items or the size of the item, depending on how, how big they are. Uh, so if you, if you want to keep a snake, you have to be prepared to, or at least with these, be prepared to feed some whole prey, huh? Some whole prey, yep. And then everything oh, we you. feed here uh, is frozen and thawed out uh, for a few reasons. Number one, I grow attached to rodents. I love rodents. Um, so I'd have a hard time feeding a live one yeah. animal to them. But also, um, a live animal, you know, if you're about to get eaten by a snake, you would probably try and, and survive and protect yourself. And so that would also minimize, you know, any injuries by the prey item to the snake. And it can traumatize a snake if it's real bad. Mm -hmm. But um, the other thing, too, would be uh, to try and minimize like a desire, like a hunting mm, okay. behavior. So we also feed them. We pull them out and put them in a separate container for feeding so that way they're not gotcha. getting excited every time we open the exhibit they they're expecting food instead we pick them up and they're either handled for the day or it's time to eat and they okay. go into a feed tank for feeding well that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. we try and separate those types of events so that way they don't just yay maybe food time and get all excited how many <laughs> how many snakes do you have here at well let's say the whole general wild encounters okay so that would be Hamel wild Play encounters Zoo. the hamel play zoo and uh, our ambassador program so we have over at the play zoo you would see casper on exhibit so when that exhibit opens back up you'll see casper you'll also see on exhibit our dumeril's boa medusa she's a really cool animal and then um in our zoo at home area we have corn snakes king snakes and a brown house snake and the, excuse me, and then on, um, also on exhibit at the Play Zoo, we have our Burmese python. So mm. right there we have quite a few animals. And then some of our behind the scenes stuff, we also have Marceline, um, and we have a sand boa, a Kenyan sand boa named Lasagna. I and love she's Lasagna. Really she's cool she's so much fun. Mm -hmm. It's hard to, like whenever we do snake chats, it's hard to pick which ones we want to do, because yeah. they're all so similar, but unique at the same time. And they're just, they're fascinating animals. Um, and so these guys are really important too because uh, they make good natural pest control. So while you're not going to see like a ball python cruising around your yard because they don't come from here, you might see garter snakes or you might see maybe corn snakes if you live uh, in rural areas. Um, but those guys are important. Like birds of prey, they make uh, great natural pest control because they eat the things that you don't want coming into your house. And so it's important when you know if you do have a pest problem to try and use natural items that wouldn't harm an animal like a like a poison that wouldn't harm an animal like a snake or a bird of prey that would catch that animal later and, mm -hmm. and, and consume it because then they would consume the poison too yeah and the other neat thing about um snakes too uh for venomous snakes specifically is that snake venom is being studied and researched a lot for uh like medical treatments for like tumors or wow. um, even like antibacterial stuff. So snakes are definitely, you know, they have 
their uses. They're, um, they're really cool animals. And again, they're not like an inherently mean or evil animal. They will give you ample warning if you're near one to just leave them alone before they actually have to do anything to you. And a lot of the times when you hear about a person having been bitten by a venomous animal, chances are they might have accidentally stepped on it or right by it and the snake just like, whoa, mm -hmm. you know? Because um, not all snakes have a nice rattle, like a rattlesnake to tell you that, hey, you're like six feet from me, uh, stay away. And, and you can maybe accidentally sneak up on one. <laughs> so. Now, you already kind of partially answered my next question, mm -hmm. which is going to be what kinds of snakes live in the Chicagoland area. Um, but yeah. in, in addition to that, do we have any venomous snakes here? And if, if so, is there, is there a way people could tell the difference between a venomous snake and just a regular like, we, harmless little garden snake? We do have venomous snakes uh, in the Midwest, too. Um, it's kind of tricky to tell just by basing, looking at them because you would want to compare... You know, if you had like a constrictor and a venomous snake next to each other, you could see some differences. Uh, for instance, constrictors tend to be quite a bit longer, um, and that's because they use their body to wrap around the prey and, and suffocate it before they eat it. Whereas a venomous snake doesn't necessarily need that much snake length. They would obviously, you know, use their, their venom to subdue their, their prey and then eat it that way. Um, another way you could tell would be um, based on head shape a little bit. And then also, um, if you're able to get a good look at their eyes, they have different types of pupils. But again, that's really hard to tell. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you good... don't want to stick your face right in a snake's face <laughs> exactly. to see what their pupils look like. That, oh my gosh. They would probably <laughs> say, hey, you're too close. Um, but So what a good way to, uh, to learn, though, would be to actually do a little bit of research and look up you know, what snakes we do have. And again, you know, another tricky thing about some snakes is that some snakes are constrictors, but they look very similar to very specific venomous snakes mm. as a, a way to protect themselves. So uh, as always, it's best to just kind of, if you're really interested, because I would, if I saw a snake, I would probably watch it for a while and get all excited. But um, if you do see one, it's best, you know, to just kind of keep your distance and just let it do what it's gonna do. Um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, what, like I said, there's over 3,500 <laughs> species of snakes and many of them look very similar. It's, it can be really hard to ID and and um, look at those. So a good way would just to be to, to do a little research, know what snakes you might find, you know, where you live mm -hmm. and, uh, and snakes that do have um similar patterns or colors to other snakes there are tricks to to know those too and you can mm -hmm. and you can look those up as well um i think in in the suburbs probably what garter snakes would be garter snakes um you might see most some common. Like rat snakes which are kind of similar to corn snakes yeah and... but they're i mean they're not something to be afraid of so if you if you had them right. in your yard you wouldn't necessarily want to try to get rid of them because they'd be right yeah, you out. what I would do is just make sure your your family knows or your pets know <laughs> there oh might gosh. be a snake there yeah. and if you have like a, a very curious dog like I do. Yes. Um, but uh, but yeah, just leave them alone. Um, and because uh, I promise you, they're doing great just, things in your yeah. in your yard. <laughs> and they'll just pretty much leave you alone. And, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. My dog got startled by a garter snake once and jumped mm -hmm. out four feet in the air. So <laughs> snake did not care. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> um, I, I think that's about all. Awesome. Well, okay. So again, happy World Snake Day. I hope you guys you know, learned a little bit. And again, I'm not asking everybody to just love snakes and, and, and <laughs> go out and get one or start petting them. But, um, you know... Just know about them, know why they're important, be respectful of them, and just kind of leave them alone unless you just want to watch them a little bit. That's, you know, it's like watching birds or whatever. But as always, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for your continued support, and we hope to see you soon.